Frank Meadow Sutcliffe, born at Headingley, Leeds in 1853, made the ancient port of Whitby his home from 1871 until his death in 1941. The influence of this isolation, bounded by the sea to the north and by miles of wild rolling moorland on all other sides, was powerful. It determined the path which his photography was to take and formed the sturdy, independent character of the fishing community which he made the subject of so much of his work. To him, the most mundane scenes of everyday life and everyday people held a mysterious magic, an ethereal beauty. He would write, the beauty of a subject depends more on the condition under which it is seen than the material of which it is composed. The sensitive photographic interpretation of all aspects of the life and activity he saw around him brought him recognition by the wider photographic world. It culminated in the honorary fellowship of the Royal Photographic Society being bestowed on him in 1935. This is the fishing port of Whitby, where the Esk River provides a safe, natural refuge between the Humber and the Tees. From here, for well over a thousand years, men have sailed out into the North Sea and beyond. On this rugged cliff top, on the site of the old abbey, Cademan, an illiterate herdsman, created the earliest known piece of English poetry. And it was here in Whitby, just over a century ago, that Frank Meadow Sutcliffe was to turn photography into an art. In 1870, the Sutcliffe family moved from Leeds to Ewcote Hall near Whitby. Frank's father, Thomas, was a painter, accomplished enough to exhibit at the Royal Academy, but a man who still found time for his family. It was he who encouraged young Frank to take an interest in the newly emerging pursuit of photography, though recognising, of course, that photography wasn't real art. It never was to Sutcliffe. I never ventured to call a photograph a picture, he wrote. My father once said to me, how can the reflection of a gutter Persia world in a brass door handle be a picture? This made me ashamed of photography. I've never got over it. One of the deciding factors that finally turned Sutcliffe to photography came about purely by chance. He picked up a book with Lake Price printed on its spine. He thought it was about the Lake District. In fact, William Lake Price was the author and the book was about photography. Frank's parents encouraged his new interest and his hobby became part of family life. But it was after his father died in 1871 that Frank took up photography seriously. One of his photographs, Sunset After Rain, was seen by John Ruskin, the great art critic. He commissioned Sutcliffe to photograph both himself and his home at Brantwood in Coniston and he did his best to encourage the young man. Frank had already met Eliza Duck, a bonny girl who worked at the Whitby post office. In 1874, he married his Eliza, despite his mother's initial objections, and the following year, unable to find a suitable studio in Whitby, the Sutcliffe's moved to Tunbridge Wells. Several other photographers had the same idea. Competition was too great, and within the year, Sutcliffe found himself facing increasing debts. He decided to cut his losses and move back north. The family came to Whitby. Whitby with its shipbuilding, its fishing fleet and its jet industry. Jet, a hard lignite found chiefly in the cliffs, had been carved since Roman times. By 1873, there were about 200 jet workshops busy in Whitby. 
This is William Wright's in Haggersgate. By 1856, a tenth of the town's population was working in the industry, busy making jewellery, though there's no evidence to show they copied the ancient Greeks, who ground it up in wine and drank it as a cure for toothache. Jet's popularity increased when Queen Victoria wore it as mourning jewellery after the death of Prince Albert in 1861. It was in a deserted jet workshop in Waterloo Old Yard that Sutcliffe first took up his studio. It was small, so small it hadn't even a reception room. And here Sutcliffe acted as receptionist, sensitised the plates, took the photographs, developed the plates, varnished the more important ones in order to help preserve the images, printed them, and then, with his wife Eliza, sometimes worked until two in the morning, mounting prints in their cottage at Stakesby. The bulk of his work was taking carte de visite photographs. They were in vogue at the time. They sold at ten shillings a dozen, and were visiting cards with small photographs on the back. To economise, he even used the mounts it had left from Tunbridge Wells. Despite its unpleasant location, his studio nevertheless attracted a wide-ranging clientele. George du Maurier, the writer, James Russell Lowell, the American poet, and even the Archbishop of York visited him, though when he arrived, Sutcliffe was so busy, the Archbishop had no time to wait. Success in business meant the family could move to a larger house and afford holidays in country villages like Glazedale and Leelholm but they usually ended up working holidays for Sutcliffe. His business may have been taking portraits, but it wasn't his passion. That was nature, nature in all its mystery. It's not perfect photographs we want, but pleasing pictures, he wrote. And that to him meant capturing the atmosphere around. The hours before eight o'clock in the morning, before the sun has driven off the mist, and late in the evening when the shadows are long, these, he said, were the best times of day. These were the times he could leave his hot, stuffy studio behind and seek out the scenes that would eventually bring him international recognition. It may have been relatively easy for Sutcliffe working in his studio. It was a very different matter when he went out on location. With me here is Colin Harding from the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television. Colin, how difficult was it for Sutcliffe? Well, David, the answer is extremely difficult. That was partly because of the complexities of the chemical process which Sutcliffe used, but also because of the sheer bulk of equipment which he'd have to carry around with him. What did that equipment consist of? Well, there was the camera itself, of course, plus the tripod on which to stand it. But he'd also have to take a portable dark tent and all of the chemicals which he would need. Now, how did he set about actually taking a photograph? The first stage, of course, was to find a suitable location, such as the one we're in at the moment, set up his camera on the tripod, and then compose the photograph using the ground glass screen and the focusing cloth. When he was satisfied with the photograph, he would then go to the dark tent, prepare his plate, and load it into a dark slide. He would then remove the focusing screen and replace it with the dark slide. Then, in order to actually take the photograph, he would lift the screen, and to expose the plate, he would remove the lens cap. The exposure would be a matter of seconds, he would count the necessary time and then replace the lens cap. He would then replace the slide and take the dark slide back to his tent, unload the plate and process it. Carrying all that cumbersome apparatus mile after mile in search of subjects, it's little wonder, he remarked, one feels dog-tired by evening. But it was necessary. 
the summer tourist season was limited. To make a living, Sutcliffe accepted commissions that took him all over Eskdale, and these he supplemented by selling the landscapes and scenes of everyday life that would eventually become his hallmark. Worthwhile it may have been, but at times it certainly wasn't easy. October 1885. The brig Mary Agnes, bound to Newcastle from London, caught in a north-easterly gale off the Whitby coast. Sutcliffe describes exactly how he struggled to take the shot. The wind was so strong it was impossible to walk. All one could do was to crawl on all fours. If it hadn't been for the help of a big heavy soldier who curled himself under the tripod and held on with both hands, it would have been impossible to have done anything. Other pictures were easier to take. But it wasn't simply a question of finding a subject and photographing it. Sutcliffe realised the need for composition. He positioned his subjects carefully, achieving a good visual balance, but he always allowed them to find a natural pose before taking the picture. Here Sutcliffe spotted the Coulson family on the quayside, the fisherman father arriving home with a catch of place. Sutcliffe set them by the harbour wall and then asked a young girl to go and look over the rail to balance the scene. Saturday afternoon, as this picture was titled, would go on to win Sutcliffe the Photographic Society's medal in 1889. It was here in Whitby James Cook learned his craft as a seaman, and it was in converted flat-bottomed Whitby-built cats, the endeavour and resolution, that he sailed on his voyages of exploration. Whitby cats like this were often used for carrying coal. In 1880, Sutcliffe was to take Dock End, the best-selling of all his photographs. On the right, you can see the sloop The Alert, built in 1802 at the Langbourne shipyard in Whitby. By the time Sutcliffe captured it, it was owned by Anthony Jackson and Edward Barker, and by then it had been converted into a schooner. Over on the left are the Lively, the Sara and the Hopewell. Before them are some typical Whitby cobbles with their cocoa-coloured sails. It's the harbour that's the very heart of Whitby, and it was here Sutcliffe returned time and again to find subjects for his camera. The upper harbour near Dock End, filled with cobbles and brigs. A topsail schooner moored at the wooden quay, there in the distance are herring mules and fishing cobbles. Penzance luggers in the upper harbour. One man who knew the harbour well is Tom Page. Tom, you were born in Whitby in 1911 in a house that overlooked the harbour and one that Sutcliffe actually photographed, weren't you? That's right, number seven, Tingot. Where exactly was Tingot? Well, it was over there, uh, where that red notice is on the wall. The entrance to it was uh, Grey Plain, which was the right of them two white houses. What was it like living in a house on the side of the harbour? It was all right. Uh, we used to get flooded at times when the spring tides was. The furniture was nailed down in the kitchen. It was wooden, a wooden settee we had. And uh, when the spring tide come, the water would just come up through the floor. Of course, you must have had some fun when you were lads there. Oh, aye, plenty of fun. There were six of us. And uh, one of the things we used to do was fishing off the balcony. You actually fished off the balcony? That's right, we did. The kitchen window faced onto the balcony and the window would be open and one or two of us would be fishing and we used to catch fish called billets and pennocks and dabs and as we caught them we passed through the window and they were put in the frying pan. Well, of course fishing was the major industry when you were a lad in Whitby wasn't it? Oh yes, very busy. 
the uh, Scotch boats used to come down, chasing the herring down the North Sea. And uh, they would start off, of course, up Aberdeen Way, and as the year progressed, the herring came down. And they uh, finish up in Whitby, and then the, they would all go on the way down to Yarmouth, places like that. So the harbour was quite congested then? Oh, yes. When I was a real uh, a lad, eight, nine, ten years old, when we lived in Tingoat, the drifters, they used to call them drifters, the boats, the Scotch fishing boats, and they were all coal fired. And it used to be full of smoke and oh, and the stink and everything. Smoke. Smoke in the harbour, mixing with the sea frets of the east coast. Smoke from the steamers. Sutcliffe may not have liked the pollution, but he used these foul emissions to good effect. The Cleveland, manoeuvring an iron steamer through the swing bridge. The paddle steam to guide with its tandem funnels. These were the everyday scenes of a bustling, busy port. Up to 1837, whaling had been one of Whitby's major industries. By Sutcliffe's time, it had long gone, and fishing for cod and herring reigned supreme. Each year, the Cornish fleet arrived, the Penzance men as they were known. After fishing for mackerel and pilchard off Cornwall, they sought herring round the coast of Ireland, then sailed through the Caledonian Canal, to follow the herring shoals south to Whitby and Scarborough. And following the shoals as they moved south came the Scottish fisher lasses. Dressed in their distinctive woolen jumpers, heavy skirts and oily aprons, they gutted the fish for transporting inland. Some herrings were retained in the town to be smoked into famous Whitby kippers. These scenes of harbour life and the fisher folk there provided Sutcliffe with a rich source of subject matter. But Sutcliffe doesn't use it romantically. He saw fishing as the arduous and demanding life it was, involving the women every bit as much as the men. They played a vital role from collecting driftwood for fuel to rising at two in the morning to see their men folk off. They made the nets and skein mussels for bait. Mussels were the favoured bait. These were imported into Whitby from as far away as Morecambe, Boston and Ireland. They were prized open with a knife, skeined or scraped from the shells and soaked in water to increase their size. Flithers or limpets were not as good, but at least they could be collected locally. The women of the family clambered over the wet, slippery rocks of the foreshore between East Pier and the Scar to prize them from the rocks with blunt knives. Then it was up to the women to bait the lines, long lines as they were known. Long lining is a technique that's still in use today. Each line had some 270 hooks and there were at least three or four lines a day to be prepared. As the hooks were baited, the lines were carefully coiled onto a wicker board known as a swatch or skep. On this the lines would be carried to the boat, occasionally in unusual ways. Then they were ready to be transported to the fishing grounds of the North Sea. The boats that sailed out from the harbour were varied. There were 17 foot long Whitby cobbles like those in the foreground. These were powered by sail or oar and were clinker built as they had been since Viking times. Their deep bows and flexible hulls made them more seaworthy. There were boats from Berwick on Tweed in Northumberland and Scottish fifes from Montrose and Peterhead. Here on the fish quay, Sutcliffe was a regular sight, always ready to tip a would be subject or offer a fill from his tobacco pouch. On the quay, the catch was sold, another job for the women, cod and herring, lobsters and crabs in spring and summer, salmon and trout in autumn and winter. Fishing was a family business, continued generation after generation. Tom Storr, 
here nursing his great-nephew Dandy in 1884. Dandy would follow in his great-uncle's footsteps as a fisherman, become skipper of the Pilot Me, a Whitby fishing mule, preach as a deacon at the Seaman's Mission, and earn the nickname 21 twice. His wife had 21 children, and when one died, she had another to make the number up again. The general public wanted clear, well-focused photographs, but Sutcliffe saw in the subtle, atmospheric moods of the Yorkshire climate dramatic opportunities. The weather we revile so in these islands, he said, is about as perfect for photographic purposes as it could be. When the fog rolled in, it created the atmosphere Sutcliffe cherished most of all. Fog had fascinated him as a boy in industrial Leeds. Here in Whitby, he used the fogs and ever-changing weather to create a romantic, mysterious world of its own. Is it any wonder Bram Stoker chose Whitby to set much of his novel Dracula? Stoker knew Whitby well. He holidayed there in 1890, and legend has it had a crab supper which didn't agree with him and that induced the dream that gave him the idea for his classic tale. And still fresh in Whitby memory was the Russian schooner Dmitri of Narva being washed ashore on Tate Hill Sands in 1885. Is it just coincidence that the ship Dracula arrived at Whitby in was a Russian schooner, the Demeter of Varna? Water has always had a fascination for boys, and lads fooling about in the harbour was a subject that Sutcliffe was to use time and again. The most well-known of these photographs created both artistic acclaim and moral condemnation. It was the water rats. Sutcliffe spotted three truants playing with a box in the water. He offered to pay them to pose for him. By the time he arrived back with his camera, there were 13 eager lads waiting. The problem was with Will Ross in the soapbox. The lad persisted in looking at the camera. Sutcliffe finally sent his brother Tommy Ross, fez and all, to fetch young Will out. As Tommy delivered the message and Will began to climb out, Sutcliffe exposed the plate and produced a photograph that would earn him the Photographic Society's Medal for 1886 and gave him what is arguably his most famous picture. It was famous enough for the future Edward VII to buy an enlargement of it. Boys gave Sutcliffe another of his most popular works, variously known as Excitement or Scotch Head. It's best known by its more humorous title, Stern Realities. Like Water Rats, it was applauded in Britain and overseas and received the ultimate accolade. It was copied by an artist, the Tsar of Russia. What did Whitby boys get up to in Sutcliffe's day? Well, I was a member of the Friendship Rowing Club. There was two rowing clubs in Whitby. The Friendship Rowing Club and the Fisher Lads Rowing Club. And uh, twice a year, Whit Whit's Nolliders and Regatta Day, we used to have races. Can you remember any of the lads who used to be in it with you? Oh, yes. Uh, Joe Howard, who's on that, whose father is on that picture of Sutcliffe's. He's the right hand fella. Oh, and my brothers were all in it. And uh, where, where did you row? We used to row out the harbour. Oh, as far as Zumzik Bay, once or twice we did. And we'll get there, fine day, and sit on the sands for half an hour and come all the way back. Runswick Bay was just one of the outlying villages Sutcliffe visited. Today it's little changed from the village he photographed. It's seen its share of history. A Roman signal station overlooked the bay from Kettleness Point, and in 1682, as a storm lashed the place, a landslide swept every cottage but one into the sea, without any loss of life. For Sutcliffe, each village had its own particular appeal. Sands End, where the sands of Whitby literally end. 
where Sanzen Beck flows slowly to the sea, and alum was mined for over 250 years. It was used for a variety of purposes, for example, in the making of medicines, matches, textiles and baking powder. The cottages of East Row, seen here, were built to house the employees of the alum works. Saltburn, an Anglo-Saxon settlement 19 miles from Whitby, and the only known photograph Sutcliffe took of the place. And Robin Hood's Bay. According to legend, the place that Robin Hood used as a haven to escape the attention of the Sheriff of Nottingham. Today it's a mecca for artists and holiday makers alike. Here's a workaday fishing village facing the remorseless North Sea. In fact, those houses on the left of Sutcliffe's photograph have long since disappeared beneath the encroaching waves. Staithes, where young James Cook worked in a local haberdashercombe grocer's shop. The tale is still told how he stole a shilling from his employer before enlisting in the Royal Navy. The village lies sheltered between Cowbar Nab and Penny Nab, with the Staithes Beck flowing through it to the sea. In Sutcliffe's day it was a busy fishing port. He took this photograph about 1912 of Margaret Shorden in the village. Notice the lobster pot behind her. It has its legends of mermaids washed ashore during a terrible storm. It had its superstitions. Mention of a pig before the day's fishing, and the trip was sure to be cancelled. And like many of the other villages along the coast, Staithes knew its share of tragedy. In 1745, the relentless North Sea swept away a row of 13 cottages, including the shop where James Cook had just recently been employed. And this is Margaret Verrill of Staithes, making her way home from the communal bakehouse. She too knew tragedy. On the very day she was to marry Billy Unthank, he, along with his father and brother, were drowned at sea. She finally married Thomas Verrill. The Verrill family were well known in Staithes. This is old Isaac Verrill in Sutcliffe's study, retired from the sea. He appeared again with this group of Staithes women. Notice the bonnets they're wearing. Anne Lawson of Staithes has been making bonnets in this style for the last 25 years. Anne, What's so particular about these bonnets? Well, they were used as a working bonnet and they have a double crown, which I can show you on here, because the ladies used to bake the lines for the fishermen on the foreshore and of course they needed plenty of crown there. I'll put this on my head and show you what I'm talking about. I look old. Um, the brim, of course, just protected them from the sunshine. Mm. They carried the basket on this broad bit here and that was to protect the back of the neck from the again the sun or the weather. And this is whilst they're working outside. And it's to work yes, because they used to work mm -hmm. outside. This now this is a different design, isn't it, this bonnet? Yes it is. This is a Yorkshire bonnet. And again it's a different style altogether. The farming people um, used to wear a bonnet as well for hair making. Uh, fruit picking etc mm. and I'm sure this is what this particular one is again it's slightly different it's shorter at the sides and I'm sure this is the one that we see in the Sutcliffe uh, pictures but I, obviously I couldn't swear to that but there's no bow on the back of this one which there is on the back of that one there isn't a double frill there's a single frill and can you see the difference yes it's longer at the front altogether Gives you more protection, yes. doesn't it? These bonnets appear in many of Sutcliffe's studies. They were featured in those genre for pictures of the ordinary men and women of that Yorkshire coastline going about their everyday work in their everyday clothes. His scenes of the mixed farming in the area, like those of the fishing industry, are today valuable social documents of a way of life now gone. As in the fishing industry, so in farming, women played an integral part in the economy. They fed and cared for the family, helped at harvest time, 
milked the cows, made butter and cheese, drew water from wells or water butts, and were on hand to help wherever it was needed. This girl, for example, is stacking turves that will be used as household fuel. And there were the skills of country life. Ploughing. The plough here is a wooden North Cave plough manufactured locally. The blacksmith, old John Rogers, shoeing a horse at Lealholm Farm. And George and Isaac Scarth, besom making at Rockhead Cottage, Glaisdale. But it was not only everyday life Sutcliffe captured. Nature and the seasons offered innumerable subjects for his camera. Beggar's Bridge at Glaisdale. In 1588, young Tom Ferris had fallen in love with Agnes Richardson, the squire's daughter. But the squire refused the marriage until Tom's wealth equaled his own. Tom decided to go to sea to make his fortune. The night before he was due to depart, he went to bid adieu to his Agnes, but the Esk River had become a raging torrent and there was no way across. Bitterly disappointed, Tom sailed away to fight the Armada and find riches and success with Francis Drake. He returned, having fulfilled the squire's demands, and duly married his Agnes. When she died in 1618, he built this bridge as a monument to her, the Beggar's Bridge at Glaisdale. But it was not the romantic that interested Sutcliffe. He was interested in people and capturing them as naturally as possible. He once said, when photographing rustic figures out of doors, I think the best plan is to quietly watch your subjects as they're working or playing. To be able to wait and watch, you will need a plate that will keep moist at least a quarter of an hour. These plates that Sutcliffe mentions were made of glass, and it was on these that the negative image was formed. Colin, how would Sutcliffe have set about preparing these plates? He would have started off with a totally clear, clean piece of glass. This he would have coated with a substance called collodion. Then he would have taken the plate into his portable dark tent, where he would dip the plate into a bath of silver nitrate. This would make it sensitive to light. This, of course, had to be done in total darkness. He would then load the plate into his dark slide and take it to the camera, load it into the camera ready for the exposure to be made. After having made the exposure, he would then take the plate back into the dark tent where he would have to perform the processing immediately. Well, why was it called a wet plate process? Well, quite simply, it was called the wet plate process because the plate was only sensitive to light when it was still wet. Once the emulsion had dried, it was no longer sensitive and it was impossible to take a photograph. So for that reason, all of the stages of processing and developing had to be performed within a matter of minutes. This is a wet plate camera, but it's different from the one we saw before. Yes, this is a wet plate bellows camera, where we see the sliding boxes have been replaced by these collapsing bellows. These were used for focusing. It also meant that when the camera wasn't in use, it could be folded up and made much more compact. This is the sort of camera that Sutcliffe would have used in the 1870s. And over here we have a slightly different camera, a later camera that Sutcliffe would have used in the 1890s, a dry plate camera. So this is a dry plate camera, Colin. But what is a dry plate? Well, as the name implies, a dry plate was a photographic plate that could be used while it was dry, unlike the wet plate process. Now this meant that the photographer no longer had to process his own plates and coat his own plates. It made photography much simpler, much more convenient. The photographer didn't have to carry a dark tent and all of the chemicals with him. All he would need is the camera, the tripod and the box of plates. And what period are we talking about? Dry plates were invented in the 1870s. This particular camera is around the 1890s. So apart from the convenience, what other advantages had dry plates? Well, the great advantage was their increased sensitivity. Uh, this meant that instead of exposures taking several seconds, as with the wet plate process, you could take a photograph in a fraction of a second. 
this meant for the first time cameras had to be fitted with shutters, such as the one we see here. As his business grew, he moved premises to Skinner Street in 1894. Dull, respectable Skinner Street, as one writer described it. The studio had waiting rooms, dressing rooms and apartments for printing and toning, and a system of central heating and air conditioning. A photographer should not be tied to one room and one light. He should have many rooms, where he could make such pictures as his mood felt, he said. By this time, the Sutcliffe family had grown. Eliza had borne him four daughters, Kathy, Irene, Zoe and Lulu, and one son, Horace. Horace would tragically die young, denied the career in photography he and his father had planned. Sutcliffe became a highly respected professional, with his portraits and scenes as popular with the public then as they are today. From the early 1880s, he exhibited regularly, and in 1888, the Camera Club of London acknowledged his eminence by bestowing on him the honour of organising a one-man exhibition devoted to his work. He wrote profusely, contributing to photography, the practical photographer, and from 1908, he wrote for the Yorkshire Weekly Post for 22 years. Sutcliffe's numerous successes his growing reputation and his willingness to experiment led to an arrangement with the Eastman Company in the 1890s. He agreed to try out various new Kodak handheld cameras that used their newly introduced roll film. Kodak, in turn, could have the use of the photographs taken. Occasionally, they would appear in their advertisements. This roll film was coarser than the plates he used. The advantage of the handheld camera was that it enabled photographs to be taken quickly at the critical moment, but it might mean that at times quality had to be sacrificed to capture the event. Here was photojournalism in its infancy. On one occasion, Sutcliffe used this technique to show the launching of the lifeboat. Tom, what happened when they launched the lifeboat? Well, the maroon would go off. What do you mean? The other side of the harbour. Now, what was a maroon? A rocket to summon all the crew of the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. Of course, there'll be double, twice as many men man the lifeboat as was needed. But to make, well, that was to make certain they got a crew. How did they see? get the lifeboat then to the water? Then. Everybody used to run down here, I know we did as kids. And the lifeboat was uh, on wheels in the lifeboat house. And the wheels were square metal things. You used to go a yard and it would be flat. And then you go another yard. Mm -hmm. And that of course was to break it for going down the hill. Into the, onto the sands. So you pushed it? I pulled it. A lot will be behind with ropes holding on, and some will be in the front pulling. And we used to get it down the bank onto the sands, and then just pull it right to the water's edge. And uh, the brave lads would go up front dragging it, it was on a, and it would float off onto the water. It was a lifeboat man who provided Sutcliffe with his best known portrait. Henry Freeman was a bricklayer turned fisherman and for over 40 years a lifeboatman. On the 9th of February 1861, a gale lashed the Whitby coast. Five times that day the lifeboat was launched, bringing helpless crews to safety. A sixth launch proved disastrous. As the exhausted crew battled against the waves, the boat capsized only 50 yards from the West Pier. At the time, Freeman was the only seaman wearing the newly introduced cork life jacket. Of the 13 crew members, Freeman alone was saved. Above the old lifeboat station, 
perched high on West Cliff, is George Hudson's Royal Hotel. Hudson, the railway king and his investors, had developed the town into a fashionable resort by opening the Whitby to Pickering Railway in 1836. The railways of 19th century Britain launched the holiday industry and the fisher folk of Whitby were quick to take advantage of it. The boards on this building are advertising fishing trips and coastal excursions. Why then are there so few visitors featured on Sutcliffe's photographs? Well, the answer's simple. When the visitors arrived, they provided a vital part of his trade. When the sun shone, Sutcliffe was busy in his studio. He was commissioned for work that took him out of his studio, but it was usually after working hours he managed to take the photographs he preferred. So Sutcliffe went out looking for scenes to record, and the best ones, he claimed, were taken when his wife went with him. Out on a trip across the moors one day, she begged him to photograph this signpost. He didn't think it was worth wasting a plate. She insisted. And Quo Vadis, as it was later known, became the second best seller of all his prints. Winter was the best time for him, but his public apparently thought little of such views. Don't do any more snow scenes, he wrote. Nobody buys them. St Hilda's Terrace is one such example. It's also a good example of how places retain their character over the years, and yet at the same time change. These railings were removed during the Second World War for scrap metal, and the road itself was eventually widened. This is Sandgate, a street which dates back to the 15th century. Here in the past, mobs in support of local smugglers demonstrated their anger against the revenue men. Today, holidaymakers saunter along it, making for the marketplace. This is the marketplace, isn't it? This is the marketplace. Yes. You'll have noticed a few changes since you were a lad, then. Oh, aye, a lot of changes. Uh, this was all uh, farmer's stalls. These were vegetables then? That's right, all vegetables there. Where, where did it come from? Oh, the farmers brought it all in from all the surrounding places. And they're pony and traps normally. And uh, I don't know what they did with pony and traps, but here, here they were with the stalls. The stalls were supplied, they were all... It was all local produce that was being brought in. Brought in from the countryside, yeah. That was uh, butter. The farmers used to come into the marketplace up there with the butter and the eggs and the chickens. And down here was an ice cream stall, I always remember. Trillos, I think it was. And you got penny sandwiches. No cornets? No cornets, I don't think, them days. Much of Old Whitby still remains. Church Street is Whitby's oldest street. It dates back to the 14th century. And much has changed. Across the river was Stockton Walk at the junction of Brunswick Street and Flowergate. It was demolished about 1887 and symbolised the changing world whose passing Sutcliffe so mourned. Thousands of little things have been altered, he complained. The photographer's mecca will be like everywhere else, and photographers will have to find another way to heaven. The coming of the First World War brought the beginning of the end of Sutcliffe's photographic career. Photography had been banned along the northeast coast, and such was the anti-German feeling at the time, he was forced to cover up the names Zeiss and Goetz on his camera lenses whilst working in his studio. Sutcliffe occasionally took on article pupils. One of them was Thomas Waterfall Gillett. After the war, Gillett made an offer for the business, and Sutcliffe eventually accepted this in 1922. The war had been a sad time personally for the old man. His wife had died in 1915, and his youngest daughter Zoe in a military hospital. So Sutcliffe retired as a professional photographer. And after a whole week of retirement, he commenced a new career 
at 70 years of age. He became curator of the Whitby Literary and Philosophical Society Museum. Gillett, meanwhile, continued selling Sutcliffe's photographs along with his own. In 1930, he moved the business to Flowergate, but still trading under the name of Frank M. Sutcliffe. It was around this time that Robert Elliot Pannett, a long-time friend of Sutcliffe's, died. He bequeathed the town a market garden to be converted into this park and enough money to build the art gallery. He and Sutcliffe had often talked about such a project on their trips to the continent. In 1931, a museum extension was completed and Sutcliffe became totally absorbed in his work as curator there. He continued as curator until March 1941, when the war brought about his second retirement. So he turned to another interest, botany, but still taking the occasional photograph. At the beginning of May, he took a study of Forsythias in his garden. It would be the last photograph he would ever take. He died on the 31st of May and was buried at St Margaret's Churchyard at Aislaby. The Times never even mentioned his death and the Yorkshire Post devoted no more than 150 words to him. But the photographic world recognised its loss. The photographic journal devoted an entire page to him. The Royal Photographic Society commissioned a special memorial lecture. His photographs continued to be sold, first under Hugh Lambert Smith, who took over the business in 1950, and then by Bill Eglin Shaw, a Loftus photographer who became owner in 1959. But it wasn't until 1965, when Granada Television featured Sutcliffe's work in their film Prospect of Whitby, that a nationwide audience was to see and fully appreciate the quality of his photography. The demand for his photographs slowly snowballed. The business was renamed the Sutcliffe Gallery, and today the work he strove so painstakingly to create commands a worldwide appeal. Bill Shaw's son, Mike, explained Sutcliffe's popularity. Mike, how does this demand compare with the demand in Sutcliffe's day? Well, in Sutcliffe's own day, he was very, very famous within photographic circles, of course. But I think nowadays he's more of a household name and the general public sort of are very much aware of his work. So how far has his reputation spread now? Well, we have customers in uh, Australia, America, New Zealand, Canada, and also Japan. Speaking of Japan, he won a particular award there, didn't he? Yes, that's right. Sutcliffe exhibited a photograph entitled Trees in a Misty Valley in Tokyo and won an award for it. Oh, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Did he gain any other awards during his photographic career? Yes, he was awarded about 60 medals throughout the world. But I think his highest distinction must have been in 1935, when he was awarded an honorary fellowship of the Royal Photographic Society. It's little wonder then that Sutcliffe's work is so popular, and that Sutcliffe himself is recognised as such a master of the photographic art. The growing demand for his work led to the opening of a new Sutcliffe gallery, this time in the city of York. It was opened officially by Frank Sutcliffe's grandson, Alan Sutcliffe Druitt, in April 1992. Kathleen Corner, Frank Sutcliffe's niece, who lives in Whitby, has recollections of her famous uncle. Ah, now when we s I saw a lot of him, we used to go and see him when he was curator of the museum. At the museum? Yes, now we often went, and his daughter had the butterflies, she had a big lovely display of butterflies. I think they're still there. What did he... Do you remember him taking you around the museum, did he...? Oh, yes, we used to go into the into the back room. You know, he was there as the curator, and he used to talk to us about the museum mostly, not about his own work. Have you taken any photographs, Miss Corner? Me? Yes. We've always liked taking photographs. So it's very much a family tradition? Yes. Anyone who can see can photograph, 
Sutcliffe claimed. But could just anyone capture the world of Frank Meadow Sutcliffe? A world of idyllic scenes and memorable moments, like the opening of the Swing Bridge in July 1908. And the people who inhabited that world, men at the fish market at Coffee House End. And women, like Mrs Wilson, second on the left, fish stall owner in New Quay, known locally as Nell Bacchus. And children, James Gray, 11 years of age. He would marry and father eight children before perishing in the bloody cataclysm of the First World War. And Lily Jackson, she would marry and as Lily's stamp would bear a son, Tom. Let him pay the final tribute to Frank Meadow Sutcliffe, the man who gave eternal life to the men and women of Whitby a century ago. The Whitby that has long gone by still lives within your seeing eye, and we who come beyond your time can in imagination climb the narrow streets and cobbled ways that Whitby of those far off days. For you have left that all may share photographs beyond compare of bearded patriarchs of the sea and bare-skinned boys who well may be of patriarchal age if they still walk upon life's stage. And bonny fisher lasses too with many a rare and perfect view of harbourside and Abbey Plain, of misty coast and country lane, of great shire horses on the land, and countrymen who sturdy stand to look at us across the years with such calm eyes, so free from fears, that now are almost quite unknown, so much the world has lost its own. Yet, so long as beauty shall survive, so long will Sutcliffe be alive.